Hey everybody, um, in case you don't recognize me because I'm dressed nice and neat. I'm Jack Holtz. Um, it's kind of it's fun to get dressed up every once in a while. It's definitely a great occasion. Um, so I'll introduce Tyler. He'll give a uh, talk to all of you, and then you'll have a little bit of time for some questions, and then um, I'll ask you all to leave, and then the committee will meet after that to finish it out. We'll ask questions. So um, it is definitely my pleasure to introduce Tyler. Um, what can I say? He's like a member of the family, basically. He, uh, Tyler got his bachelor's at um, Colorado School of Mines, where he uh, then also worked a bit with Jeff Andrews Hanna. Um, and he went off to industry a bit and worked out in the field doing measurements in remote places um, before he decided to go back to grad school and uh, approached me at the University of Texas, um, where I assured him I would not leave. Um, <laughs> is it one year later? I don't know. Something like that. Not even. I, yeah. you know, <laughs> I got, you know, as you know, I came here. But I told Tyler, look, you're coming with me. Um, like, you really don't have any option. You know, I, no, I gave him the option, but he came, you know, uprooted, moved again, came here, part of that whole process. Um, so that was pretty disruptive, but uh, he handled it great and has uh, converged on a path for his research that I was very happy about because I've been interested in rock glaciers as Mars analogs since we made the initial discoveries with Sherrod. Um, and it turned out we didn't really know much about rock glaciers on Earth. Um, and we, he even helped write the proposal that eventually got funded. Um, that allowed us to conduct studies on Earth with these enigmatic features. And I have to say, at the outset, we knew pretty much nothing, and really neither did anybody else in the community. And uh, Tyler has, through a lot of hard work, many, many field excursions, measurements, campaigns, um, learned so much um, and greatly advanced the state of the art. And uh, the community is just starting to, to recognize that. And that's for planetary analogs. There's also been a parallel effort on the Earth side to understand these uh, for Earth processes and how they respond to climate change. What do they mean? How, how are we going to use them in the future um, as water resources and things like that? So um, it's, it's definitely, his work is going to have a significant impact for the community with both things, which is pretty amazing. So, um, and some of this, I, it's kind of amazing. Usually I write a proposal and we end up doing things very quite a bit differently than what we say we're gonna do. Um, we pretty much accomplished everything we set out to do in this proposal, um, which I am I was amazed by. Like, and it's only through Tyler's perseverance. Um, he does not do anything halfway. He goes all out. Like he, he will dive into a subject and I was like, I'm like, well, okay, see you when you come out. And then he comes out with something really, really good, you know, um, and that's just the way he is. He doesn't just take things lightly. Um, he's been an incredible member of my research group going back to UT. Um, it's just like, I can't even imagine him leaving um, because he's just been an ever present part of the group. Um, most of our fields work. Tyler's there, uh, stable presence, nicest guy, um, great role model for other students and helps everybody out, super patient. Um, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be really hard to lose you. But it's time and you've got a great post, he's got a great postdoc lined up at Washington University with Roger Mikulades, working on uh, mostly, I guess, permafrost, but it's, it's, it's kind of wide open, so you'll be able to um, anyway, I should probably shut up so we can get started. I don't want to take too much of the time, but it's been a real pleasure, like really, um, and I look forward to uh, hopefully collaborating with you in the future. I would, yeah. Um, wow. So, <laughs> without further ado, <laughs> oh, I failed to mention he, he played a significant role in two NASA proposals last year that are still in review. Um, so there's a chance to collaborate on those if they get funded. Um, yeah, so that's really cool too.
All right. Okay. Oh my gosh. Wow. So yeah. here we go. Geophysical measurement and monitoring of planetary rock glacier surface processes. Laser pointer working. All right. I'm going to go ahead and close this out. So thank you, Jack, for that very kind introduction. I um, So I'll say too that there's an audience on Zoom. I don't know. I can't see the exact list or anything, but thank you all for being here, um, yeah, both online and in person. And in the spirit of the fact that I spent about half of grad school during the pandemic, I'm going to present this kind of like a Zoom meeting. So I'm just going to sit here and run through uh, my with my laser pointer so everyone can see where I'm pointing. And then Jack did mention um, the significant field work that went into the, all the data that you will see in the presentation, as I think you can count, that's eight field campaigns to rock glaciers, uh, mostly in Alaska and Wyoming, a little bit of Colorado as well. And honestly, it would not have happened without every single person who contributed, all of you for being here, everyone online and people who can't be here who supported it and helped out with the logistics. So it was genuinely a huge team effort. And I'm beyond grateful uh, to be at this point and to share, share this work for you. Um, so I'll just take a deep breath with you all here together and then we can get going. Okay. <laughs> so pop quiz to start out, we see these two lobate flowing objects coming out of these mountain cirques. And I'm wondering, are they rock glaciers or debris covered glaciers? My answer, it's a trick question. It doesn't matter for this talk because they exist in a continuum. Uh, debris covered glaciers, they are, as, as their name, they're glaciers covered with a layer of rockfall debris. They retain their entire glacial stratigraphy and generally the debris is thinner. And on the other end of that, that end member continuum, we have rock glaciers, which are mostly infiltrated meltwater, generally thicker debris, and they overlap in, in this continuum where they're these flowing landforms, as I mentioned. And most importantly, they have this transverse ridge morphology, uh, which could be due to flowing or due to other factors. And I've just showed this diagram right here because it's, it's a nice schematic of some climatic factors that can influence the transitions between uh, glaciers to debris covered glaciers to rock glaciers, such as this uh, equilibrium line altitude, ELA, um, and really each system or each valley, uh, they, they overlap and they have their own unique personalities as to what type of glacier or cryospheric feature will develop. And it's based on a lot of things such as the valley geometry, the geology of the headwall, how fast it erodes, how the shape of the blocks that fall off of there. Um, so what we really care about instead of whether or not they're debris covered glaciers or rock glaciers is where do these transverse ridges come from and what can we learn from them? So we have two end member models for our, our transverse ridge morphology. So we'll start up here on the upper left. You, you start out with this debris covered ice core rock glacier, debris covered glacier landform. So one way that ridges can form is simply by flowing and compressing at the surface where we have this, this buckle folding of the debris layer. You can almost think of an accordion getting squeezed together and the, the debris layer is, is bunching up like an accordion. Alternatively, we can develop climatic ridges which are caused by climate oscillations where on top of this first debris layer, D1, we accumulate a, a smaller amount of ice on top of that debris layer. And then over time, you get oscillations of ice accumulation and then rockfall supply. And eventually, as the ice advects down the slope, these, these ridges will act as outcrops of these internal debris layers. So in theory, we could measure those climate signals by inferring that some of these ridges extend into the subsurface and create these internal debris layers. Um, also, since we're in planetary science and we're talking about terrestrial analogs, we know from satellite data that rock glaciers do exist on more than one planet. Uh, I have an example here from one of our field sites 
at Sourdough, Alaska. And then this is a really nice example of a glacier-like feature. Uh, this is a high-rise image at Deuteronomus Mense in Mars. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the scale bars on here, but both of these features are approximately uh, the same, same width across just a couple of kilometers. But on Mars, uh, surprise, surprise, there are actually huge debris covered glaciers and a lot of them and they're really concentrated in the mid latitudes of Mars. Uh, so this is another indication that they are a transitional landform, uh, similar to, to what we're seeing on Earth, and also analogously to the, the features on Earth, we see these, these transverse ridges as, as the glacier flows down from the headwall towards the plains here. Um, and one of the ways that we can confirm that there is a significant amount of ice beneath the debris on, on these glaciers is from orbital radar data, uh, where we can detect this, this basal interface. So we're getting an echo from the base of, of the glacier. And then by correcting the travel time measurement to a depth measurement and fitting it to the background surface topography of the plains, that dielectric constant that's required to uh, correct for the velocity and correct the travel time to, to match up with the planes, that dielectric constant fits very well with high purity water ice. Um, so we have evidence that there's debris covered glaciers on Mars and there's significant ice deposits. And here's that globe map just unwrapped to show just how common these, these subsurface glaciers are on Mars. And, and multiple studies have, have examined a few different um, methods of mapping out these, these landforms and buried ice features. So in orange, we have just a, a geomorphic mapping showing these uh, viscous flow features is their classification on Mars. So those have been mapped out in this mid-latitude band in orange. And then this, this green shading here shows a combined water consistency parameter uh, uh, produced by the swim team. And that combines all sorts of remote sensing instruments to create this, uh, this consistency value where one is uh, essential, uh, certainty of subsurface water ice and then zero. Uh, it's actually a, a one to negative one scale, but I've only plotted zero to one to show where there is a higher likelihood of water ice. And you can see both of these, these data sets are concentrated in um, the, the mid-latitude bands. Um, and on Mars, these are very important features for understanding um, the most recent climate history of Mars. So there's uncertainty as to how ice has migrated between the mid latitudes and the poles. Um, and basically over the last billion years, uh, which on earth is kind of unheard of, but on, on Mars, that is the, the most recent geologic time period. Um, so that's where those, those climatic ridges come in is, can we hypothesize that those ridges record climate oscillations and then by mapping out those ridges, can we then map out uh, paleoclimate scenarios uh, over that late Amazonian period? Um, another important parameter is to understand the erosion and transport rates from the headwalls of these debris covered glaciers, as well as mapping the overburden thickness. That's something that uh, still can't be mapped out with the current gap in knowledge uh, just based on the, the Sherrod radar uh, frequency. It doesn't have quite a good enough vertical resolution. And then of course, the, um, the, the big question for the future of planetary exploration, especially human exploration, is how much water is there and how, how can we get to it and, and where's the easiest place to find it? Okay. So to answer some of these questions, uh, we will, we've done this terrestrial analog study and I've broken it up into some guiding questions that we'll work through on uh, increasing levels of, of movement and complexity. So this first set of questions, how much subsurface ice is preserved? How is it distributed within the glacier at this moment in time? Those are static questions. And then our kinematic questions address how fast are the rock glaciers currently flowing and how is the surface changing? How is the elevation increasing or decreasing? 
Um, so just mapping those changes are our kinematic questions. And then we'll wrap those all together into the dynamic questions of when did the ice accumulate? How is the, the rock glacier system coupled with the climate? And what are the surface processes that are occurring on both Earth and Mars that are comparable that we can then associate uh, and, and infer that these processes are occurring on Earth and Mars and that we can actually conclude that we're mapping climatic processes versus uh, just compressional ridge formation. So that's this main underlying question here, is does the ridge classification actually inform us in, in paleoclimate reconstruction? And then finally, at the end, we'll go back and, and talk about our, our results from the terrestrial analog study in the context of Mars. So as I mentioned, uh, it's broken up into static, kinematic, and dynamic measurements. Um, so with, with the static measurements, that will focus solely on the ground penetrating radar, uh, GPR. Uh, for those of you, um, I say GPR means ground penetrating radar. Um, and then we will move to our uh, combined remote sensing analysis, uh, where we've measured the, the change of our field sites, mostly using drone imagery, um, as well as, as piloted flights in Alaska. Um, so we, we've used a lot of remote sensing imagery to measure the surface change of our terrestrial field sites. And then finally, we'll, we'll combine both of these, uh, these two types of data to try and get at a gridded bed map for, a, uh, for a, a numerical model input, as well as some conclusions about our classification of climatic and compressional ridges. Okay, so I wanna introduce you to both pairs of sibling rock glaciers that we, that we were lucky enough to travel to as our terrestrial analogs. So we went to Northwest Wyoming um, and our sort of our, our main field site there is Galena Creek. That's been studied since the 70s. Uh, a scientist named Noel Potter started that research. And then there's this nearby larger rock glacier that's facing east and that is uh, Sulphur Creek Rock Glacier. And then we move to Alaska, where we have Sourdough facing south and McCarthy Creek facing west. So we actually have one rock glacier for each cardinal direction. And I just want to mention uh, for the rest of this talk, I'll actually have all of the rock glaciers oriented downward on the screen so that they're it appears that they're flowing downward. But this is the real orientation. And we're really lucky to have these field sites because having them so close together in these two regions allows us to make local comparisons as well as understanding how these different regional populations are evolving. Okay, so first of all, how do we measure the rock glaciers right here, right now, without any, any time consideration uh, other than radar travel time? Um, so we want to use GPR here, and what we're doing is uh, in this, this survey, we, we can see that we are transmitting a radio signal into the subsurface, and it's reflecting off of dielectric interfaces, uh, especially the base of the rock glacier, but also internal layering. And then we are measuring the travel time for that signal to be received by the receiving antenna. If we do this in this common offset configuration, just sweeping across the surface as, as we see in this picture here, that gives us a basically a 2D cross section of, of the subsurface of the glacier. But an important aspect of calculating the actual thickness and depth of that reflection is the radio wave velocity, since we need a velocity and a travel time to then convert to depth. As I mentioned, that's exactly how the, the ice on Mars was inferred was uh, through this, this dielectric velocity. So we can actually measure that rather than just assuming that and how we measure this dielectric constant or the radio wave velocity is this, this geometric method of the common midpoint survey. And all that is, as the name implies, you start at a midpoint and then you move the transmitter and receiver outwards. So you know how much your spacing is increasing and how much the travel time is increasing. So that gives you a velocity measurement. But as you can see by this dashed line, if there is any slope to the reflector, that'll change 
your ray path, which will then affect your travel time assumptions. Um, so the, the bulk of this work was to show that accounting for that slope angle from these, these dipping reflectors, and here's a, an excellent example, just some foreshadowing from Galena Creek. There's just so many dipping reflectors in rock glaciers that it's just impossible to ignore, ignore them when, when you're measuring them. So it's really important we found out that you have to do both of these configurations in one place to accurately characterize both, you know, with the common offset, you get the, the depth and the structure and the subsurface image, but you really need the common midpoint combined with the common offset because you can measure this dip angle from, from the common offset. So when we set up these two equations as the system of geometric equations, then we plot that on this dip angle versus velocity axis down here. And where those two equations intersect is where the data tells us that it's consistent with both configurations for that specific velocity and dip angle of, of the sloping reflector. So here's just an example of why that's so important. Here's uh, the middle of Galena Creek where we have this, this pretty significantly dipping reflector. And if we didn't account for the dipping reflector, if we just thought the angle was zero, we would actually be greater than the value that's possible for pure ice. So we, we want to make sure that that value is below this 0.17 meters per nanosecond um, value. So by accounting for this, this dip angle, we actually are able to bring the velocity down to just below our, our pure ice value at a dip of about 25 degrees, which is also consistent with the common offset section. Um, and that's also consistent with observations that we've made in situ where, where we actually are able to dig through the debris and see that there is pure ice there. So this velocity actually makes sense and it's, it's not too high. So finally, we can take those measured velocities at each point and plot them on this dielectric mixing plot to, to calculate. So we assume the dielectric constant of ice and then the dielectric constant of the pure rock. And then we, we mix those together in a few of these different mathematical models. They're pretty similar, but there's a few differences along that spectrum. And then we can actually plot the ice fraction at each of our sites uh, along, along this uh, continuum of of ice versus debris. And then we can also map that out on each of our field sites. So we can see Galena Creek, for example, there's relatively pure glacier ice all the way down until we hit this transition zone. And then all of a sudden it drops off. Uh, there's almost no ice based on our dielectric mixing model. And then Sulphur Creek is similar, lots of ice up top and it decreases going down. And sourdough is, is a little strange it seems to be relatively homogeneous, uh, not much change in velocity there. But again, so we now we have those ice fractions and velocities and we can take those travel time measurements. And this also gives us these nice maps of, of radar thickness, both of the bulk rock glacier thickness as well as the debris thickness, um, which we do have to assume a different velocity <coughs> for the debris thickness. Um, with, with our GPR and our, our, uh, our static measurements, we are able to get both debris and ice thicknesses as well as ice fraction and uh, the, the structure of the uh, internal uh, glacier. So now for the kinematics, this is a, a well, it's, so it's more, more movement. So we have to uh, go back to get this repeated remote sensing imagery. So by nature, it requires at least two field campaigns or flights or satellite imagery acquisitions. Um, and we've really focused on using drones or UAVs uh, to, to really get into these valleys and get high resolution, high precision imagery. Um, this is just an example of the flight path and the photo locations on one of these drone flights at Galena Creek. And then this is a, just a great picture that Michael took of kind of the most exciting part of the drone flight where you don't want to break the camera as it's landing on this very rough rock glacier. So it does take a lot of uh, 
concentration and you know you can get some vertigo from standing and looking up on a slope surface. So that's one of the challenges and as well as just the amount of topography um, and it can cause co-registration issues with the data. So that's why it's really important to also have um, these, these high precision ground control points, um, which I I've shown here, we place those around the glacier and then map them out with uh, differential GPS um, where we can get really high precision positions to then uh, essentially use as validation points on uh, or control points on, on these ortho images. So these are examples of some of the products. This is one of the ortho mosaics at Galena Creek. And then this is a hill shaded DEM. You can really see it gets some good detail and we can make out a lot of those, those ridges. There's this thermocarst pit up top. So to measure the horizontal change, uh, we use this algorithm called CIAS, or Correlation Image Automated. Sorry, you can, it's online. CIAS <laughs> algorithm. Uh, so what it does is you specify this reference block, which I've shown here in red, as well as a larger search window. And it takes this reference block from the initial image and it searches throughout the search window, all of the different combinations of, of blocks within the search window. And it takes a normalized cross correlation coefficient of, uh, of those two blocks. So wherever the maximum correlation coefficient is in that search window is where it maps the displacement. So that's this, uh, this displacement right here comes from the maximum correlation coefficient. And then we can map those all on the grid over the entire rock glacier. And that gives us this really nice vector map of uh, displacements, or you can divide that by the time interval and easily get the velocities. So this one of Galena Creek is just really nice. You can see it has this, this flowing structure to it. It speeds up on a steep area right here flattens out a bit and slows down and then really speeds up at, at this break in slope. And then if you'll remember from the GPR results, this is where it transitions to more ice poor, ice cemented rock glacier. And it, it actually slows down um, at, at that same location. And then if we compare that to the neighboring Sulphur Creek, we can see that both glaciers aren't the same. They're, they're not flowing uh, the same way that Sulphur Creek is actually these vectors are pointed inward in, in this upper part of the glacier. And then the bottom part, which we measured as more ice poor, it's actually the fastest part of the rock glacier. So we think that this section up here, it's actually from the, this middle section melting so fast and there's a bunch of ice exposures and it's thinning out so much in the middle that it's actually slumping inwards. And consequently that, that warming and, and melting may be causing some destabilization at the toe. Um, so this just goes to show that every single valley, even though they're right next to each other and experience the same macroclimates, that many other things uh, play a role in, in how they evolve, even in the present day. Um, and you may be wondering how accurate are these, these uh, vectors that we've mapped out. And luckily with a lot of hard work from our team, uh, we've mapped out a lot of boulders that were initially spray painted by Noel Potter. Uh, I think this round of Potter's, mo or most round of rocks were spray painted in the 90s. So we have a, a 20 year record. Um, he was kind enough to share, share those positions. So what we've, we've done is you have to set up this differential GPS where you have a base station and then there's this rover you can kind of see down here. And then we have many other team members, grad students, whoever wants to rove around there, they're walking all around the glacier, finding these spray painted rocks and recording them. And then we can go and calculate the displacements from Potter's data and map that onto our own displacements. And that's what this plot shows is the difference between this uh, ground-based displacement and our remote sensing displacement. And overall, the results are very, very good. These, the only big circles which denote larger magnitude errors, those are already located at area, areas near the margin. So it's where you expect high velocity gradients anyways. And 
the, the change detection algorithm may not pick up those, uh, those gradients over the five meter uh, grid interval. So we, we do have very high accuracy data uh, for our drone results. And then up in Alaska, um, to show you some of the results there, we have an eight year record, uh, thanks to some collaborators up at University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, and we have mapped out in, in this plot, I just did the displacement over single year time intervals to show some limits of this method where you, you really need a, a longer time interval, as I've mentioned down here, to, to get a, a cleaner signal. So the longest time interval between uh, images in, in this series is 2016 to 2019. And you can see that the, the signal just flows better. It's less noisy. Whereas some of these single year uh, time intervals, you can still see the same pattern where the trunk of the glacier is the fastest. But overall, it's noisy. Like October 2020, there was a dusting of snow. So you really want longer time intervals, which is why more data over more time will allow us to get both a higher temporal resolution, but also improve that time interval to, to improve the signal. Um, and then McCarthy Creek, uh, we actually need to, to create this long time interval by mapping it out to this August 2014 base image. You can see it's pretty noisy all the way up until we get to this 2019. So it's a five year interval before you can start to see the signal. And that's because McCarthy Creek is about half the speed of sourdough, even though again, they're right next to each other. So once again, there's some, some nearby local variations in, in evolution that we have some hypotheses, but there's definitely no definitive answers. For example, why they're moving a factor of two different off of the same peak. Um, so one thing we can uh, uh, analyze just based off of those, those flow profiles is if we take a longitudinal velocity profile and just multiply that by the distance it's traveled from the top, that gives us the age, so the total length of the glacier. And the velocity profile of the glacier gives us about how long that, that glacier has been flowing. So for, this is Galena Creek um, and Sourdough is here in the middle. And both of those are actually very similar, just above 3000 years of age. Um, and I'll note that we didn't do Sulphur Creek because as I mentioned, there isn't actually a full down valley profile because it's collapsing inwards. But then McCarthy Creek, which is right next to Sourdough, it actually gives us an age about twice as much, which makes sense because it's moving half as fast. But again, that just highlights these, these evolutional differences and that the each rock glacier really has its own personality and, and is dictated by some really specific parameters that can be hard to simulate uh, numerically. So another product we have from our photogrammetry is we get digital elevation models. And if we take those digital elevation models from each flight and subtract the earlier one from the later one, we get a surface elevation change. And when we do that at Galena Creek, this is the result we get. Uh, and if we take this, this profile across uh, this raster image where we, we have that elevation difference. Um, so you can see this image is more red than blue, which means there's a little bit of a negative bias. And this plot confirms that, that it's mostly below zero. But if we map the on-glacier signal versus the off-glacier signal, we do still see some patterns where the on-glacier elevation change is a higher negative magnitude than the, the stable ground surrounding it. And it also has a higher variability. You can see that the, the amplitude variations are much higher on-glacier. So this does tell us that we are seeing some real um, surface elevation change but it is masked in, in this bias. So that's kind of some foreshadowing as, as to um, some things that, that we'll be looking into more in the future. But if we do just take face value, the, the mean elevation change on glacier versus the mean elevation change off glacier, that does come out to about 20 centimeters of, of subsidence over just three years at Galena Creek. Sulphur Creek is even more pronounced. Um, so we had to compare it with an older DEM. That's why this is 1985. 
But actually that longer time interval is beneficial to us because we can really see these, these hot spots of melt popping out. And you'll notice one here, that's right in the area where we were noticing the inward slumping of, uh, of this glacier. And then two and three are actually basically clean ice. So those are just melting uninhibited. Um, so we, we see that both Sulphur Creek and Galena Creek in Wyoming have some pretty rapid melt occurring beneath, beneath their uh, debris layers, whereas Sourdough and McCarthy Creek, um, you see both these images appear more blue. So there's a bit of a, a positive bias here, but there doesn't appear to be a significant difference between the stable ground on glacier versus off glacier as a whole. Like you can certainly see some oscillations on sourdough, uh, maybe down here where there's another collapse pit, there's something happening. But as far as glacier wide thinning, uh, we don't see that in Sourdough or McCarthy Creek. And we actually are lucky enough to have some, some meteorological data to test those, um, those conclusions of melt rate. So what we did is we took the air temperature um, over whatever time series or whatever time interval those, uh, those photogrammetry flights were completed. And we used this thermal melt model um, to estimate the daily melt. And we didn't allow any melt when there was snow on the ground. So then we, we, met, we calculated the total cumulative melt over those time intervals. And very interestingly, both Galena Creek and Sulphur Creek, uh, these red lines indicate the, the measurement, uh, the melt rate from the photogrammetry data. So both of those measured melt rates agree pretty well with the melt rate for a low thermal conductivity debris layer, uh, which actually fits in with, with some of the literature. Uh, for example, Eric Peterson has a really interesting paper about heat flow in, in the debris layer. Um, so it was really interesting that, that both of these, these glaciers did return a low thermal conductivity value. Alaska, we use that same low thermal conductivity value. And as you'll see, this, this plot's a little different because it we only had three years of an entire year of, of temperature data, but all three of those years when, when backed out to a melt rate, um, all three of those years are right around the noise level of, of our photogrammetry data, which I have in red. So it also makes sense that we're not seeing any definitive thinning in Alaska. So the thermal uh, meteorological data also um, is consistent with our, our results. Okay. So what do we do when we put it all together and how does this help us understand the ridges and how we can understand the climate and how we can simulate rock glacier evolution? Um, so yeah, I'll just jump right into that and then uh, take a bit a look at how that applies to Mars. So first of all, we, we can combine our GPR data. Um, you might remember this one from the GPR section where we found a bunch of internal reflectors uh, going down this section of Galena Creek here. You see the tiny little gap where we couldn't really get over this, this big hump there with the GPR, um, but we still see these nice continuous internal debris layers even going through that gap. Um, and if you'll remember the kinematic ages, uh, for the rock glacier. We can also do that if we just map out the outcropping points for these internal debris layers. And we can take the kinematic ages of those points and then back that out to figure out approximately the, the year that those debris layers were in place um, or a, a, the decade perhaps. So you'll see that there's about you know 10 to 30 year intervals or so between these debris layers. So that's really exciting news in that we can detect these internal debris layers and that from our inference of uh, estimating the age just based on the flow velocity, we can estimate how long those internal debris layers have been flowing and, and when they're in place. And they're sort of regular, but sort of random spacing is also a testament to the the influence of randomness and stochasticity of the rock falls and certain climate events that all go into 
the accumulation of debris layers and the present preservation of ice um, and the uh, and the flow of the rock glacier and our ability to detect it. So jumping now to our um, our attempts to, to simulate rock glacier evolution, um, we first of all we need a bed map. We need the the topography of the, the base of the glacier to figure out how thick it is in 3D. Um, so we tried a few different methods. Um, this flow line mass conservation is the most dynamically accurate because it uses this continuity equation um, and we use the, the uh, flow field from our photogrammetry survey. And we also use a, uh, a flux gate from the GPR, so a, a cross flow profile that tells us the cross-sectional area that's flowing through um, that region. And we also use uh, this GLATE method uh, from Langhammer et al. out of Zurich. Um, and that's a joint inversion, which includes this, uh, this driving stress from, from Glenn's flow law, just a basic surface slope uh, input. And then we also interpolate all of our GPR picks um, and an exciting thing about this one is that we were able to include some of the, the drone GPR data that we started collecting in 2022. Um, so that one incorporates all of the GPR data as well as the elevation model. And then we also use this Glenn's flow law with a debris modification. And that only uses the uh, photogrammetric surface velocity data. Although this, this value here, D, that's the debris thickness, which we do need the, the GPR data for that too. So I can, I can include both of those. And here, here are our results for those methods. And you'll see the most noticeable thing is this flow line mass conservation method is a much lower extent than the others. And that is because uh, it relies on the flow lines of, the, of our um, photogrammetry results. And that uh, can diverge very easily. So Really, it's, it's the most uh, dynamically consistent, but it's also the most limited in terms of extent and stability of the model. So then we have this GLATE model. We can see there's kind of these sort of big jumps that we might not expect, and that comes from the GPR interpolation uh, that, you know, that the interpolation may need to be refined. And this section right here, I don't really believe because that's assuming pure ice, and this is really kind of off the side of the glacier. And then for Glenn's flow law with the debris modification, this seems, uh, and I will, I'll say that this GPR data, it does show some uh, characteristics that are common in, in all of these data sets. For example, like this one and all of them, they show this, this thick area here in the cirque, and then it thins out over here and then it thickens again before finally uh, transitioning to the rock glacier right here. And the problem with the Glenn's flow and debris modification is that there is this sort of high frequency spatial artifact that uh, we wouldn't expect the, the rock glacier's base to be that rough. Uh, so all of these methods do produce a result, but they, they do have trade-offs um, if we want to input them into any sort of numerical models. And then another important thing to consider in numerical modeling is the, the flow parameters and the rheology and how the ice deforms with stress. Um, so I, I did this interesting analysis where I just took these cross flow profiles across our photogrammetry data and tried to fit it to this empirical equation um, from the physics of glaciers. And I didn't get a quantitative fit just using a simple cost function but I did notice qualitatively, if you, if you look at these patterns, so profile one and three, we have low slope and high ice fraction, which fits the assumptions of this empirical model the best because it comes from a larger valley glacier. Um, so this actually qualitatively fits the best when the assumptions are best fit. So low slope, high ice content, when the slope increases and we get a, a faster velocity, we get more of this trapezoidal shape. Um, so there's a more gradual increase and a, a narrower peak uh, for both two and four. 
So those are consistent in the steeper sections. And then profile five, where we have low ice fraction, but also a low slope, we get this opposite where it's, it's more like a plug flow where basically it instantly increases to its max velocity and then just all flows at the same speed. Um, so while we don't have any, any con conclusive quantitative trends there, that qualitative correlation does indicate a uh, potential uh, stress dependent and lithic fraction dependent um, viscosity or rheology. So since it's really hard to simulate all of these different uh, processes and ridge formation mechanisms uh, in a numerical framework, we actually got really, really lucky this year and we were able to just observe it all happening all at once with our GPR data and our, our flow velocity data. So what I'm showing here is the strain rates on, on Galena Creek and what this shows is you're just taking the velocity gradients in each direction um, for each component of the velocity. So XX is showing how the X component of the velocity is changing in the X direction. So essentially how it's moving across the page and opposite for YY, it's how it's moving down the page. And then shear is, it's how, uh, how the, the uh, body is shearing and we're, moving in different components. Um, so now I'll just zoom in on these different features. Um, and one of the interesting patterns that I noticed, we, we actually mapped out ice exposures while we were there. We just took waypoints when we found them. Here's a really nice one that we found at the top. And then this one we've actually found multiple years in a row in, in this area. And you'll notice that they basically connect the dots along this red section here. And red, I, I forgot to mention, red is compression. So that means the, the continuum is moving in towards itself and blue is extension. So it's the opposite. Um, so we've, we've mapped out these melt streams and ice exposures and didn't even plan it. They all aligned along this red line here. So that's showing us that where this melt is concentrated, we, we do actually observe some slumping inwards. Um, and that's related to what we we're seeing on Sulphur Creek as well. Um, and then just to say these strain maps uh, or the shear strain maps is really nice to uh, clarify these glacier margins. So you see the dotted line is what I map just based off of optical imagery, but then we can actually really nicely map out the actual flow margins where, where these colors pop out. And you can actually see this secondary load coming into the lower rock glacier here. But the real star of the show is the YY strain rate. And that told us that we actually can find where the compressional ridges exist and how we can delineate those from climatic ridges. So I'll just zoom in on, on that um, and show the, the GPR data. Um, so this section right here is, is where we're focusing and I've labeled it with, with letters uh, to, to denote each individual section. Um, so the, the glacier is flowing down the hill here and we hit this extensional area right at D. And you can see on the radar gram, it immediately thins. So you can envision the debris is getting pulled apart like the accordion, it, it thins out and then it flows down this steep section. It was very hard to, to collect GPR data there, but we were able to get it and we got the, this thin debris layer. And then as soon as it hits the red, the compression again, it starts to thicken and starts to compress into this accordion shape and these compressional buckle folds. And you'll notice that there aren't any internal layers propagating from, from those, those ridges. So those are conclusively compressional ridges and you can see them actually on the hill shape, they just pop out and they're, they're everywhere on this part of the glacier. If you've walked there, you know it's, you have to traverse those. And we actually see those in the GPR data and the internal debris layers don't show up until the very top here, basically by the head wall where you're getting this debris facilitated ice accumulation. So that was really exciting to see that we actually can find out where the ridges are more likely to be compressional and that is just based on where we see compression in the glacier surface. Um, 
And then here's just to drive the point home what the actual topography looks like. So we are expecting the extension right around here. And then the compression should be occurring here, right as it, it flattens out again. And then just a shout out to the team members again for helping collect that GPR data because that really, we couldn't have done it and we couldn't have made that conclusion without um, us tackling that, that steep section. Okay, so with that GPR data and the strain rates in hand, we can then go ahead and interpret all of the ridges on Galena Creek as climatic here in black or green is compressional. And we even are lucky enough to see at this extensional part, there's some crevasses, uh, which are basically just normal faults, uh, a brittle uh, a failure of the ice. And then I also mapped out those, those melt streams. Um, so using those, those criteria, we can definitively quantify uh, and interpret these uh, ridges as compressional or, or climatic. And I'll just say we can notice that the climatic ridges really only occur in this upper cirque before they get too deformed, because as soon as they hit the extensional section, then they begin to emerge uh, and, and the melt rate increases. Um, be happy to talk more about that because that's a really interesting area. So now we just need to go back to Mars and apply our conclusions of our ridge classification criteria. And I've really only just scratched the surface of these four really interesting regions of Mars that are just loaded up with debris covered glaciers. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, to apply the method of the kinematic age to some previously mapped features. I, I looked at the glacier-like features by uh, Sunis et al. Um, and they, they provided a, a nice database of the lengths and elevations of these uh, glacier-like features. So I was able to actually just calculate a simple kinematic age based on that length and assumed maximum velocity along the head wall. Strangely enough, the kinematic age is very, very close, at least order of magnitude, to uh, this, this wrap layer, the widespread recent accumulation package mapped out by Smith et al. And that's the uppermost uh, package of, of layers on the North Polar layered cap of Mars. And that was inferred to be about 370,000 years. And you'll see on our histogram here, our, our peak distribution is around 300,000 years. So that's an exciting result in, in that um, those two data sets are consistent. And then we can infer that the glacier-like features, this, this major ridge make, uh, constituting the terminus of the, the glacier-like features, um, that constitutes the major climatic ridge. And then if we look around more, we'll actually see all of these, these stratigraphic um, sequences from the head wall. And this is a good example in Eastern Hellas uh, from the head wall to the terminus on this end. And they do seem to mirror the, the polar ice deposits, especially the North Polar Cap um, that's been mapped extensively by many members of our group uh, with Sherrod radar. And if we just look at the major units within the, the polar layered cap and the mid latitude deposits, we do see some parallels. So if we map out this first major ridge here and we call that the wrap, widespread recent accumulation package. And then we have this heavily layered and lots of ridges. I am not confident in calling those compressional or climatic, they could be both. Um, we need radar data to be conclusive, but I'm sure there could be both of them in that area. So this heavily layered area is also uh, analogous to this, this bulk MPLD section, which makes up the majority of, of that MPLD. And then as we get out to the terminus, we get this apparently more degraded and deformed and possibly more ice poor unit um, that would be much older since it's at the, the, the bottom of the glacier. So it, has to have been flowing the longest. And that actually matches up well with this basal unit, the BU. Um, so I've just gone a, done a preliminary mapping showing that we can infer some of these, these major um, stratigraphic 
anti-deposits essentially. So that's the idea is that when the orbital tilt changes on Mars, the ice can migrate from the poles to the mid latitudes. And we're actually seeing uh, with, with these sequences that the two populations of ice deposits are mirroring each other in their stratigraphy and that we have this older basal unit that appears to be more degraded and then this bulk layered deposit that seems to have been relatively stable and continuously accumulated. And then this much more recent wrap deposit that could still potentially be accumulating or, uh, or changing or degrading um, even through the present day. There, there is, is still some weather on Mars. Um, so um, additionally, there's some, some uh, 3D radar data that is just coming out. And there's a lot of analysis that needs to be done in the future, but there is this potential internal reflector using this 3D migrated data. So that's super exciting. Um, obviously more work needs to be done to look at more glaciers and do more mapping, but there does seem to be some consistency between uh, these two deposits, these two populations. So then just looking at all of the different um, regions that I, that I mentioned on the, the global map of Mars. Um, if we look, for example, Phlegra, this is in the, the Northwest area of Mars. And this is a concentric crater fill and the basal unit appears to be um, relatively well exposed. Whereas in Galley Crater in the Southwest hemisphere, this basal unit is extensively exposed in um, then Eastern Hellas, which is Southeastern hemisphere, it's more in the middle uh, versus Deuteronomus mense, which I showed in this previous slide, that has mostly younger deposits um, as in general. Um, so that's why I'm saying on in, in this bullet point here, that's why I'm, I'm arguing that the, the stratigraphy suggests that the uh, ice accumulation centers migrated from the southwest to the northeast throughout the Amazonian period. And this is consistent with the, the, the fact that the south polar cap is older than the uh, north polar cap based on crater, date, crater age dating. Um, so just to summarize, um, for our, our static methods, we must have our, our dipping reflector correction to get an accurate radio wave speed, and then that will give us our depth and ice fraction. Um, our drone-based data is highly accurate, highly effective, and it will be further incorporated into cryosphere monitoring programs if I have anything to do with it, which I will. Um, and we can combine all those sorts of, of data to really get at these complex processes that are occurring on, on rock glaciers and debris covered glaciers. And it's really hard to model them numerically. And there's so many different balances between order and chaos and uh, these very specific parameters that must go into it. So there's a lot of really smart people working on that. And I'm excited to see what we continue to learn with all this data that we've collected. Um, and yeah, like, like you saw with, with the Mars, uh, the CTX mosaic, the global CTX mosaic just came out last year. So lots and lots of mapping to be done. Um, lots of collaborations hit me up about my ideas. I'm sure you all have some good ideas too. And uh, with that, I will take questions. Thank you. Okay. Oh, we, yeah, we're trying to wrap the questions up by now, but let's go ahead and give, you know, 10 minutes or so for questions. Non-committee members. The, the bit at the end about the anti-correlation between what's going on in the poles to the mid-latitude is really, really fascinating. Is there any sort of a smoking gun you could look for, a smoking gun that you've seen to just really nail that? I, as far as the anti-correlation, I think, I can't think of a smoking gun 
morphologically because it I just think of the um, the uh, GCMs and the obliquity the the global climate models um, simulating the the obliquity changes of Mars and that I think is the best current evidence we have that we know that I should be migrating from the poles to the mid latitudes and as far as morphological evidence I know there's ideas to do more in-depth crater counting especially to, to get some some age dates uh, along the uh, length of, of the debris covered glaciers um, but yeah I would say if we were to get more high resolution radar data then we could then start to map one to one like the I guess it'd be like a dynamic time warping in, in mapping the individual layers from the mid latitudes to the polar layer deposits and see if we see like a dust layer in the polar layer deposits versus a gap in the ridges in the mid latitude deposits. So I think that would be the, the best way to quantify it. Connecting with uh, what you just said, if you were to design a new radar for Mars, uh, <laughs> what kind of what kind of radar would you be? I would send that question right back to you, <laughs> definition team. No, I mean I um, I think having a SAR is the the next step. Synthetic aperture radar. That's primarily an imaging radar. Um, so we would get topography from that, but also having the potential for INSAR and really uh, high fidelity topography. And then of course you could switch that into sounding mode, you know, if it's an L band, higher, higher frequency, higher bandwidth than Sherrod you know, to, to fill that data gap. Um, but yeah, no, I, like I say, I, I defer to the IMIM measurement definition team because that's a, uh, I, that, I'm all on board for that. I would hope that that, that gets funded. Yes, uh, Emily Shoemaker's online and she wants to know, what do you think about these debris covered glaciers you visited as planetary, planetary analogs? And are there better sites to visit to compare to more directly to Mars? Yes, yeah, thank you, Emily. Um, the, the main failure in the analogy between debris covered glaciers on Earth and Mars is the influence of liquid water. Because um, we see whenever we go to our, our terrestrial sites, we're always hearing the water below the debris. Um, and that's, that's definitely modifying the surface and that's what's creating our a long flow uh, melt collapse pits, whereas say if I go back to, I mean, this Hellas example is really interesting because this really degraded section, you don't see any sort of fluvial geomorphology. It kind of seems like it's more just a chaotic collapsing um, character. So I think there's more sublimation obviously on Mars. Uh, so liquid water is the main difference between the two. But as far as the processes of ridge formation of, of glacial ice and debris layers, um, and then the compression of the ice itself as it's flowing, those are, those are both analogous. Um, and then to your question about better terrestrial field sites, I would say Antarctica is as close to Mars as we'll get on Earth. Um, especially the dry valleys of Antarctica. And there have been studies out there that have taken GPR, they've measured the internal debris layers, and they actually concluded that at that flow rate, because um, they are, they're older ice and they're slower and colder, that those could actually be a, um, a, an effect of these orbital oscillations of the, the tilt axis. Um, so that is the best comparison, but it's also much more expensive and difficult and logistically complicated to get there. Um, 
there is kind of an in-between area that our group is, is very curious about researching in the future, and that is in the, the dry Andes, uh, because that's high elevation, not a lot of water, not a lot of air. Um, yeah, yeah, so there, there are a few uh, other terrestrial field sites that, that we're interested in, but as far as the proximity, we're really lucky to have been able to get up to Wyoming and Alaska just with previous connections, as well as all of the infrastructure that's in place. Because I can't, you know, can't stress enough how hard it is to, to do field work out there. And that's why I'm so thankful that we had the teamwork and yeah, the, any other terrestrial analog field work would take even more work. Um, it sounded like Galena is a bit of a unique site from the forward terrestrial analogs and that we could, you could see the compressional ridges and all of like the strain rates and everything. Can you, are you willing to hypothesize what makes Galena unique in being able to see these features and why we don't see it on the other ones? Yeah. Yeah. So I think Galena Creek is basically the perfect scenario one parameter that I had the idea that could quantify that is the accumulation area in the circ versus the perimeter of the circ, because that affects, if you're assuming the same erosion rate over a certain accumulation area, that dictates your debris thickness, which then dictates your thermal conduction and your overall melt rate. So Galena Creek is perfect because it's small enough where enough debris can can grow on it to preserve the ice where sulfur creek you know it's basically three times the surface area um, so at the same erosion rate the debris is significantly thinner at, at any given place on sulfur creek which is why we see it collapsing so rapidly and it just didn't have the ability to form those those climatic ridges so really the the bowl shape of, of Galena Creek has, has helped it to have those specific parameters. And that's not to say that couldn't occur at other rock glaciers that we can't just drive up to, but out of the four that, that we're able to look at, that is one of the more unique factors. Um, so yeah, perimeter to accumulation area could be something to look, look into. One last question. Oh, so, uh, you mentioned the importance of, uh, you know, uh, coming up with a good design for a survey with GPR, right, and taking into account slopes and everything. So, let's say we send astronauts to, to Mars near an LDA, they need to find water and ice for, you know, fuel, just to drink it or even just study the possible climatic record of an LDA, what kind of GPR survey would you would you employ in that case for a for an LDA on Mars? Would it be different than let's say Earth? Yeah. Yeah, that's I mean they are different, especially for the big LDA, since they are more uh, pancakey. Monty, for lack of a better word, so they're less linear, at least compared to the ones that, that we've um, that we've surveyed. My mind also goes to being very thankful that the Ingenuity helicopter worked so that we could just use a drone and not have to walk on the surface there. But I, for example, like on this one, I, I would start out with a single longitudinal profile. Uh, I think that's the single most important thing you can get, especially in the context of, of these ridges, because the longitudinal profile will get you compressional and climatic ridges, um, as well as the base, assuming that you don't have loss problems. And, and all. Assuming that loss and resolution isn't a problem, yeah, I would start with the longitudinal survey Yeah, and maybe even for something like this, it would be just better to do not even like a single cross flow survey, 
but yeah, I, yeah, I, I would start with like longitudinal or radial to get internal layers. Yeah. All right, let's thank Tyler. Yeah. Everybody else, everybody besides committee is excused and uh, we'll take a minute break. Sure.